Hi, good morning on this Saturday morning. You have definitely joined the wonderful podcast of Writers on Writers over at Triple Expresso. I am your host, Patrick Greenwood. We're deeply honored today to have a gift and an incredible person joining us today, Eugen Kim. Good morning, Eugen. How are you this morning? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for having me. Oh, absolutely. And Eugen Kim, obviously the author of A Place to Take Root, which, by the way, I have a copy of it. And I'm also blessed uh, because I know Eugen as well. I have an autographed copy of her book as well. So, Eugen, I know the book was incredible. It came out. Um, you and I have had a chance to talk before. Um, you were actually my very first podcast when we were doing a dry run and trying to figure out this whole madness and how to put it on YouTube. Right. And I thank you for that. Uh, it obviously, we've come a long way um, putting this together. But one of the things that was, uh, you know, when I first had a chance to meet you and you were putting the book together, and I, I had the honor of being one of your development editors and reading the early story it really kind of touched on the experience of an international student. And, and many of us here uh, that were not international students that grew up in America, that, you know, we went to high school, we went to college, we applied, we did our SATs, did all the stuff we did to get into school. For international students, there's a whole other different dynamic that went on. But you came from a little bit different background. You were accepted to one of the top universities in Korea. You, you did kind of live the Korean dream of going to the top, one of the top three sky universities. And yet you wanted to come to America. Why? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. And thank you, Patrick, for you know reading the book in mm -hmm. advance as a as a beta reader. And that was really mm -hmm. helpful. Um, so yeah, I do have some a, a, a little bit different trajectory compared to other international students in the mm -hmm. sense that I did go to Korea University and it's considered to be um, one of like um, Ivy League's um, Ivy League school in Korea. Mm -hmm. So it's called Sky. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I left all those behind and I came to America was because one, I already had this dream of working at an international organization. And obviously in, that's Washington DC and, you know, like somewhere in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that like, you know, in, in at some point in my life, I'm going to America. Mm -hmm. And second was more profound, I think. It was about really like a freedom and opportunities. So when it comes to freedom, I know Korea is a very free country. Um, it followed the footsteps of America when it came out with the war. Mm -hmm. And comparing to our neighboring uh, neighboring country, North Korea, it's um, amazingly a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazingly free country. But mm -hmm. we did have this tradition when I was um, in a middle school that we had this all these regulations on our hair, on how we have to carry ourselves, on our uniform, and that's just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, you will see overall in the society there is this. There is this feeling of, okay, we are all Koreans and we somewhat have similar experience from one to um, with other people. And it felt like our life paths were somewhat determined. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that America has this diversity and freedom. So I really wanted to experience that. And boy, did you. <laughs> so, but I got to tell you, one of the funny things about reading yeah. the book, or you talked about your life in Korea, and, and you had a wonderful family, a very supporting family. Um, even when you initially did not get into Sky and you got into another university, your father was incredibly supportive of you, um, yeah. which I found wonderful because obviously I've known a lot of Asian families in my life, um, and that's not always so. You know, everyone is dubbed a failure immediately if they don't meet the highest expectations, then exceeding high expectations. Yet you did everything possible to try to get into Sky initially. You did not. You did get into another university and then you did eventually get applied into Sky. And your father and mother were very supportive and your sister as well. But when you made the leap to say, you know what, I want to shred the Koreanism for a moment. I want to go try America for its diversity. It wasn't that easy. They didn't they didn't buy into the, the the idea of doing that, but you did it anyway. So when yeah. I read your book, and I and I obviously I knew the original title, and I know the title changed to become this, you know, place to take root. Were you looking to want to both belong in America and establish America as being this is where I want to be, or were you not even sure? 
where you really were eventually going to set root? I think at that, when I was younger, yeah, it's, you, you had like a really, um, it's, it's, it's right that my father mm -hmm. was not too excited about the idea of me coming mm -hmm. to America because mm -hmm. I was already going to this, con this great university and most importantly, it costs a lot, um, to live in America and study in America. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I did it anyway. And. I did it anyway and I after I persuaded them of course because mm -hmm. you know like I said I, I really wanted to experience how it is like to live here mm -hmm. and I don't know like if I had like a really concrete idea of okay I'm I want to live here eventually but some way somehow I, I kind of like saw it as a long term mm -hmm. um, at least I wanted to work here after graduating from college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know like about like settling down here or anything like that, but working definitely I wanted to give it a try. Well, you, you obviously accomplished that as well, which is great. But I, I have to ask you, I know this was really a core DNA of the book was the really kind of the mental health challenges of international students coming to America. And everyone just thinks you get off the plane, you know, you have somebody there with open arms welcoming you into the dormitory, taking you through to every class, you know, helping you as you kind of stumble. And as many people do not realize that international students have an incredibly difficult time, not only adjusting to Americanism and all the diversities we have here, but sometimes even just ordering food or, or knowing where to go. And, and a lot of times there is people that are willing to help, but there's also people that will manipulate. And there's also people that will obviously try to do things that, you know, you don't want them to do. And yet the other part is that is the language barrier. You know, we assume that everybody that comes from overseas to go to school here knows English or they speak really well. And I think you had some challenges with not only having to speak English, but really just kind of looking around going, how, how do I do all these things? And and I think that led to some real challenges early on for you. Yeah. So I'm incredibly privileged to go to like a very good university in Boston, which is diverse and supportive of international students. And with even with those supports, I felt I felt like, you know, like I do I can't figure everything out here. Mm -hmm. And like you said about the language barrier, yeah, in Korea we do have English tests and we do learn English early mm -hmm. on. But it's very hard to be fluent in English, like in speaking manner, uh, when you just read and like listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaking is something that you developed by communicating, communicating with other people mm -hmm. and being really in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when I first came to America, I started worrying about even grabbing a, co a, a cup of coffee at Dunkin Donuts yes. and just having like those ang anxious thoughts in my head. Mm -hmm. So it really is not easy for international students whose whose um, first language is not not English, mm -hmm. and and you know when when you feel like you can't even communicate with other people, mm -hmm. it it's it's very hard that you can't have that self confidence mm -hmm. um, for so long. Well, one of the things I was inspired about your book that I hope other people read and enjoy is that being an American uh, and being white and being a traditional education person, that I'd assume everything is just going to be right there in front of you. It's going to, the books are going to be there, the classes are going to be there, the tuition is going to be there. But I think watching and reading your story was about how challenging even simple things are. But yet there are people out there that are willing to help. I know you got inspired by working with different professors and being a teacher's assistant and, and, and getting yourself around. I mean, you kind of broke this that, that stereotypical mold, to be honest with you, in a really great way because you, you are Korean. You came here to study, but you, you turned out that your favorite food wasn't Korean food. What became your favorite food when you came to America? Well, I, I still love Korean food, but I do like Mexican food. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I do love Mexican food, which I have never tried mm -hmm. in Korea. Um, it's it's really great to experience this di diversity and diversity mm -hmm. in cultures and food. Yeah, that's like one thing that I really love in America. When you when you first started in the writing, I remember I had a chance to read the one of the development edits, and I talked about raising your passion level up or making that connection to passion. 
And one of the things I was hoping for that would have come out in the finished product, which it did, was really about when did you finally feel like you belonged? When did you finally realize, hey, okay, this is the moment in which I really belong here? Because I know you went through a lot of struggles on still trying to find a way to, to you know, come in, in the society and understand and be around people and, you know, and challenges there. But when did you finally say, okay, I, I, I now belong here? Mm. That's a really great question. So right now I live in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. this is a place where um, everyone comes and goes. Um, mm -hmm. We have people all over the world, and mm -hmm. there are not many people who actually grew up in, in D.C. or in the surrounding states. So here I do feel like having stronger bond with other people because they understand how it is like to leave home and having to travel back and forth once a year or once was um it was a twice a year mm -hmm. and that's that's i think that's that's where i feel when i felt like okay maybe you know like i, I feel like more home here but about the about the question of a sense of belongingness i don't think people can feel so sure that okay i belong now mm -hmm. you know it's there is always a, a feeling that you know like a, a part of you is different from other people around you and mm -hmm. i think the um, important thing is i learned to embrace that and I, I learned to be okay with being a little different from other people because everyone is very different here right well, that's very true. And I'm glad that you came to that realization because one of the challenging things that people really, to truly really explain America, it's not America is not one people or it's not one group or it's not one entity. It's really a mixed bag of everybody. And everybody. <laughs> we all come from something, right? Yeah. But I think the fun thing is that it's when you finally realize that you've sort of found your tribe or you really realize that you found where you belong in life and what you're doing. America gives opportunities for that. And I think that was yeah. one thing that drove you to come here was you knew that this was a major melting pot of everything, but you had to decide ultimately which part of the pot you wanted to be part of and, 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 be, and be comfortable with that. And I think you finally you know, became comfortable with the environment that you're in. Because I know it was a real challenge to go through school and challenges to find work and, you know, and trying to, you know, take advantage of the education that you had. And it, it just, you know, sometimes you had to kind of work a little harder, but you definitely broke the mold as far as international students, because you not only thrived, but you also thrived in a way in which you, you took advantage of what was in front of you. You know, education opportunities were there, in, internships, you know, working as assistant, you know, getting involved in programs to really better yourself because you knew that that's what you had to do in order yeah. to find a way here. Exactly. And on on that, you know, like the, the reason why my my title is a place to take root and you, you like people can read where is that place to take root. And one of the places is myself. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say it, because, you know, like you don't really need to look at your surroundings and see, mm -hmm. OK, do I belong here? Can I place my roots here? Mm -hmm. um, you actually root in yourself, mm -hmm. your identity and know who you are. And then really like wherever you are, you'll be okay. You know, you don't need to feel like you have to have that sense of belongingness and mm -hmm. have to have the kind of validation that you're similar mm -hmm. to other people. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to like mention that. Well, one thing that was good about that piece when I was reading that in the book was how you finally realized that how you got there. And when you got exactly. there, it was an incredible moment. But I have to ask you, I remember you wrote a piece in the book, and I'm not going to give too much away because I want people to read the book. But you wrote a piece on saying how you had a degree from Boston University. You had an, a postgraduate degree from Tufts University. And you're still trying to find a job. You're still trying to find the, that career, that job. And, and going through interviews and people are like, geez, you have all this education and you can't find a job, right? And then you found a way to kind of overcome that as well. How did you feel when you were sitting there with, I've got these degrees, I went through the education system, but yet I still can't connect myself to that, that job, that career. How did you feel at that moment? I felt like I could never be successful in America. You know, I have all this, in, all this background, all this degree, mm -hmm. and I still feel like I can't get a full-time job. Then how am I going to go beyond and further and be successful here? Um, 
and yeah that was that was actually like a tough realization but when i finally graduated and it was really the time that i have to set aside my own judgment or my feelings aside and just have to go for it right i have to talk to people put myself out there and see what happens in the world and i slowly like kind of grown into it so i learned how to networking people how to talk to people how to put myself out there so yeah it's it was a tough lesson but i i grew out of it so i'm, I'm glad that i had it i had that experience i'm hope that if no one gets nothing more out of your book that's what they get out of your book is the persistence that you had to work through breaking out of your shell breaking out of your traditionalism and saying i've got a network i've got to step mm -hmm. out i can't rely on where i'm at right now i can't rely on how i am i have to really get uncomfortable and go this way in order to really fulfill my dream. And once you did, you landed at the uh, IMF <laughs> as a very <laughs> successful economist. Um, yeah. And I'm very, very, obviously very, very proud of everything you're accomplishing with that. So let's talk a little bit about this, okay? Yeah. Book came out, had a good launch, had an excellent launch. How did it feel when you signed with your favorite pen? How did you <laughs> feel to sign the very first book? I felt grateful. I felt grateful that I was able to do this. And I remember the very first moment that, you know, I actually want to pursue this and I actually want to see the book in the reality. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how that's going to happen. And I just had to talk to people and trying to figure things out. And it finally came true. I felt relieved and grateful that it, it's, it's here and I have Wait. it. Well, you went, to, you went recently to a bookstore at one of the universities in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah. How did it feel when you were walking around the bookstore and you saw the book on the shelf like that? It's it's the same. It's, um, it's surreal, and I'm very grateful that I that it happened. Um, and, you know, like, I always had that dream whenever I go to the bookstore and library, you know, it'd be really cool if I see my book in there and on this shelf. And it, it happened, and... It's, it's just a wonderful thing to experience. Well, as you know, I always ask this to writers that come on the, the podcast, what's next? You wrote <laughs> this book, it's published, it's out, it's doing great. You're doing, you're in, you're in UCLA, you're at Georgetown, you're in several you know, bookstores and universities. Yeah. People are reading your book, students are, international students are reading your book. Obviously the question is what's next? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. And, you know, in my book, it's, my book is really the first five, six years of my experience in the U.S. And it stops when I get my current job. And I want to keep writing this book, like not literally, but, you know, I want to write a sequel in the sense that I want to keep pursuing my dream and, and um, become who I want to be in America and specifically that's in economic policy area. Mm -hmm. And I am planning to pursue my uh, PhD program in upcoming years. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I can be um, an economist who, who can really help uh, government authorities and people around the world to, to um, solve their, their economic problems. So you think by writing this book and helping you come out of your shell, break a lot of the previous stereotypes, kind of going forward and being into where you found root in life is going to help you with this next dream? I think so. Um, it's because by writing the book, I was able to look back and organize my, my thoughts about mm -hmm. my, like the first five, six years in Boston mm -hmm. and you know, I'm still working on all the um, all the issues that I talked about mm -hmm. in in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, identifying yourself, ident um, identifying mental health problems, mm -hmm. and maybe self esteem issues. And mm -hmm. there are days that I feel like I feel a little down. I feel a little less confident, and I do think about, okay, what did I write in my book? You know, mm -hmm. am I am I doing what I said that I, I learned? Mm -hmm. So this is really helpful um, for myself just to organize my thoughts, but also to keep keep moving and growing. Mm 
<laughs> well, to have a little fun, let's just take you in the future for a little bit, okay? Now yeah. you're in your 20s, you become 50s like me, right? You recently posted on social media that you had a picture, I guess you attended an economic forum and you had a famous economist was there. And tell us the story of how you kind of got a chance to go meet him. Yeah, so that happened right yesterday and mm -hmm. it, it, it was a wonderful experience. So, you know, I, I know him because he wrote uh, many textbooks and do many work in this macroeconomic policy mm -hmm. area. His name is Olivier Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting down at the research conference and, you know, I just like, looked in like who's in the audience and on the, on the first row, I saw a man whose whose back looks like him. It's like, okay, is it is it him? And I decided to walk him walk up to him, mm -hmm. and I I had to wait a little bit because of course there are people who wants to talk to him, mm -hmm. and I waited, and I just exchanged a few words and asked about a question that I wanted to ask for him to mm -hmm. for a long time, and he was very kind and and um, very um, very organized now. In his answers too so yeah it was it was a, a surreal moment definitely so do you see yourself 20 years from now sitting in an auditorium sitting there minding your own business and this international student who's 19 walks up and says i think that's eugen kim <laughs> not really her how would you feel then if that happened to you how would you feel if you're the older person the experienced one now and you have this young person coming up to you going oh my god eugen kim you wrote a place to take root how would you respond to that person? How would you feel? I would feel great to, um, I'll feel great knowing that my book has helped people. Well, and... it, has. it has, it has. I mean, I read it and I was changed by your book because it really gave oh, me a you. whole different perspective of when I see an international student, you know, at McDonald's or Taco Bell who can't order food because they just can't again, step up and help reach mm -hmm. out and say, oh, do you want two or three tacos? You know, to make simple things happen because everyone needs a little extra to see through. And that's what makes us great. That's what makes this country great is that we're all willing to come out of our own shells to help others. Your book really showed that there is great humanity in life, that people are willing to help. And you had great mentors. And now that I've always kidded with you and said, when you become my age, make sure that you don't forget the little people and help some of the younger people out. But I like to see that in a couple of years when you're like that one sitting in the auditorium, and somebody walks up to you going, do you have a minute? I got a question. And and I and I just really was inspired by your book, how you reached out to people that then came and said, here, let me help you. Let me, let me give you some guidance to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the kind words. And mm -hmm. definitely, um, it's, you know, that's why I, I wanted to write on this specific topic, because when I was younger and, I went, and when I was in the situation, Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I had the guidance I needed. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this this helps people and you know when that happens in the in the future like 20 years after I'll feel very very good that you know okay this actually did what I wanted it to it to do. So let's talk a little bit about how can people get the book. Is it what's the best way to buy the book? What's the best way to get hold of you? How if someone has questions about the book, how can they get hold of you? Yeah, sure. So you can go to my website um, if you want to con if you want to contact me. Um, the website is eugenekimauthor.com and you will see the links to LinkedIn or my Instagram and just feel free to email me if you want. Mm -hmm. And if you want to grab a copy, I think the best place to go is is Amazon. Um, it's easier. And if you want to grab an author's copy, there is a section in, on my website to um, purchase purchase one. And, and I'll, I'll send the book and, and send right right to you. Well, I also know that some proceeds uh, of your book sales are also going to some causes. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? So I am supporting um, other international students uh, by donating um, by donating copies from in the name of my sponsors, um, my supporters um, before pre-sale campaign. Well, that's beautiful. And thank you for contributing back because I know you've learned from your experience. You're sharing it with other people. Your book is amazing. I look forward to whatever you do next. I'm hoping you do an audio book, honestly, because I think if someone heard your voice <laughs> and they got to hear your soul speak through that, I think that would be an incredible part as well. Eugene Kim, 
All the best to you. Thank you for an incredible novel. Thank you for your wonderful friendship. Love to have you on. Whenever the next project comes out, let us know. I'd love to have you back on the podcast again. I'll definitely do. And I had a lot of fun today. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for having me here. And I, it's always a pr- pleasure to communicate with you and, 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 you know, like have fun. Thank you. Everyone, thank you very much for joining us on this week's at the Writers on Writers over at Triple Expresso. This is Patrick Greenwood. We'll see you next week.